Good morning, everyone. Thank you. Thanks to every one of you for attending this very important webinar. Um, and I'm very proud of having um, Oscar, our trusted lawyer here. Um, the recent changes to the BC Residential Tenancy Act has um, honestly have uh, puzzled everybody, especially um, the landlords and then the, the uh, realtors and the property managers. And then it's created uh, some kind of um, problems and issues. And then hopefully um, Oscar is gonna give at the end of, towards to his end of um, presentation, he will give us some um, insights on how we can handle the, these potential problems that have been caused by the recent changes to the uh, Residential Tenancy Act. It is extremely important for us as licensees to be updated by, with the rules and regulations and the changes and then see how the, these changes affect our business and how we can mitigate the risk or how we can uh, navigate this situation, the new situations without uh, causing any friction or with mitigating all the frictions. That's extremely important. We have a ton of questions, Oscar. I've received so many questions to ask you. Hopefully we will have enough time. Now, before introducing Oscar, I would love uh, to give a couple of um, housekeeping notes. First of all, this um, this webinar will be recorded as you have noticed. So, and we will, we are planning to post it on YouTube. So it will be available in future. Secondly, I truly appreciate if all of you mute yourself. And then if you do have any question, please text your question or post your question on the text chat or in the chat box. And then Oscar will answer the questions. I, I believe uh, Oscar's presentation will not take more than, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes, and we will have enough time to answer your questions. Now, without further ado, a little bit about Oscar. He is, uh, I know him for now the last couple of years, and uh, he's been extremely helpful with my team, with myself, and also our clients. Uh, and uh, I'm very happy that we've been able to form this business relationship with Oscar and his team. Oscar is a housing lawyer. He he specializes in many fields, um, strata title properties, landlord issues, tenancy acts, and the tenancy issues. And then um, also he helps uh, property managers, licensed property managers, and then the strata managers as well. Um, he runs his own business. He has his own team. And then um, he's very reasonable. He's active. He's always, always available. And that's uh, what makes him stand out in the, in his among his competitors. So um, with that, I pass it on to you, Oscar. We still have two more minutes, as I said, I mean, with, until you introduce yourself and then we uh, start. And then please, Oscar, you let me know anytime you want me to. I do have the control of the slideshow. Uh, just Perfect. let me know. I'll, yes, this is you now. <laughs> Yeah, oh, that's scary there. That's a skip. Skip that image very quickly. <laughs> Let's move on to the next slide. Um, no, so uh, as as Shireen was mentioning there, um, our, our firm we do residential tenancy law and strata property law. That's kind of our bread and butter. Um, we also do other real estate disputes there. So you know, generally speaking, we you know if there's a uh, problem with the sale of a property there, you know, some buyer defaults, let's say, uh, then then we can handle those type of situations as well. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, resident tenancy law and strata property law have really, uh, since I launched this firm, have have has kept us very, very busy, um, has allowed us to grow really at an, almost an exponential rate there. I mean, I started this firm about four years ago, and it was just me, myself, and I, and now we have a team of seven lawyers um, and possibly looking to add more in the future there. We'll see there how, how things play out. But uh, in any event, um, you know, and, and part of the reason why we've been so busy is because of the government that's made us very busy by all these changes. Um, you know, it, it's uh, not surprising to say that the government that is currently in power, the provincial government, um, has made it a priority to try to fix the housing issue. Um, now, you know, the, the goal of this presentation is not to go into any sort of politics there. Um, you know, whether you feel that the policies are good or bad is a normative discussion. That's not something that I'm going to really be touching upon on today's presentation. Uh, but, you know, the rules have been made. 
the rules have to be followed. And, you know, we want to make sure uh, certainly you as real estate professionals, but, you know, more specifically the landlords that you're working with, and if there are any landlords who are joining today's presentation, then we're talking directly to you. We want to make sure that you're aware of all of these changes and that you know how to adapt your practices in order to not get burnt, basically. So, um, Shireen, if you can uh, skip over to the next slide there. Uh, okay, next, next one after. There, there we go. That, that's perfect. Um, so today's uh, presentation basically... Uh, We'll, we'll come in three sections there. The first and, and the bulkiest section is the uh, significant changes to the landlord's use and occupancy notices there. Um, you know, Hi. these were called formerly two-month notices, and now they are um, something else there. We'll get to that in a second. But um, that's the most, that's the bulk of today's presentation. Uh, then we're going to talk about very briefly about changes to the extra occupancy clauses. And then finally, we'll leave off with what I call coping strategies for landlords. So essentially, in light of these changes, what you should be doing, basically, right? Um, so we can skip to the next slide here. The first, uh, again, first part of this presentation is changes to landlord's use and occupancy notices. So the easiest way for me to break this down for you is to first start off by explaining what was, and then we'll get to what is now, okay? So what were the requirements previously? Well, what, when you wanted to occupy a property for your own personal use as a landlord or that of a close family member, you needed to issue a two-month notice, and that two-month notice could be contested within 15 days by the tenant. You had to pay one month's rent compensation. So, you know, it wasn't free, basically. It was a situation where you had to compensate the tenant. You had to make sure you're acting in good faith. Now, good faith is a very, you know, kind of arguable or debatable subject, basically. Um, you know, it is often the exact dispute that we have at the RTB is whether the landlords are acting in good faith. But, you know, but by definition, by what the RTB provides, it's not sufficient to just have the primary motive be the primary motive. So, for instance, you know, we're saying, okay, well, I want to take back the possession of the rental property for use by my son, let's say. Okay, fine. Uh, that may be the case, but you also have to have a lack of an ulterior motive, a secondary motive. So, if, if the, the goal really is, you know, let, let's say you had a... Uh, dispute with your tenant previously a very nasty one and now you kind of want to get back at them uh they you may be found to have an ulterior motive for that notice right so so that's important to keep in mind good faith is a big requirement um obviously occupancy by the landlord or the close family member so close family member means uh either yourself your parents or your children or your spouse or their parents or their children. Notably, family member, close family member does not include brothers and sisters. So don't think about using a, a you know, previously two month notice to take back possession of the property for your brother. That's, that, that doesn't count. Um, and then of course, uh, previously the two month notices were downloadable off of the RTB's website. It was a PDF form you downloaded, you filled out, you signed and you served. Now, in the context of sales, and Shireen, this is where, you know, probably most of your agents are going to salivate at this, this part here. <laughs> um, you know, it, there were three requirements. You needed an accepted offer to purchase, right? So you couldn't just start issuing the notice when you knew you wanted to sell. You actually had to have an accepted offer. You needed to have all the conditions of that uh, sale contract fulfilled or removed um, prior to issuing the notice. Now, sometimes you'll have the condition that, you know, the notice be issued. So that's the one condition that can remain until you issue it, but then you've technically then fulfilled the, that condition by issuing the notice. But all the other conditions subject to financing, subject to inspection, all of those things would be have to be removed prior to issuing the notice. And the purchaser would have had to request in writing that the landlord issue 
the notice uh, to the uh, tenant. Next slide. Uh, now, there are a couple of requirements that came into place once the tenant vacated. Uh, first of all, you need to make sure that you are going to occupy the rental unit within, quote unquote, a reasonable period of time from the effective date of notice. Now, what is a reasonable period? Well, if you look at the guidelines, it tells you, the RTV's guidelines will tell you that the reasonable period is relatively short. We're often talking about maybe a two to three week period, um, you know, which, which complicates things because if you're doing renovations prior to moving in, sometimes those renovations can take two to three months, in which case you have to really consider, well, do you really want to take that risk basically that you may be in breach of this requirement? Um, the second uh, of the two requirements was that you would have to occupy the rental unit for a minimum of six months. And the previous notice, sorry, previous penalty for non-compliance with these two requirements was a 12-month penalty that you'd have to pay to the tenant. So um, effectively, if you breached, even if you did not move in within a reasonable period of time, or if you did not occupy the rental unit for a minimum of six months, then the tenant could apply to the RTB and basically ask for 12-month rent as a penalty against the landlord or the purchaser, depending on the context of notice there. Now, um, what type of issues did we deal with at the RTB, again, prior? Uh, obviously, I mentioned the good faith debate, whether the landlord is acting or was acting in good faith. Um, Shireen, I don't know if you remember this part here. I'm sure that your office had a couple of these at least. Um, we would have issues where the RTB hearing date was scheduled for after the completion date of the sale. So you didn't know what, what, what was going to happen basically to the uh, tenancy until after the completion date of the sale. And if you have in your sale agreement a you know, vacancy clause, basically that you're, you're warranting that you're uh, issuing vacant or delivering vacant possession, then you're in breach of the purchase sale agreement all of a sudden. Right, so those are types of issues that we had to deal with. Um, obviously, we had to deal with issues where uh, there was a 12 month penalty that was being claimed and we had to deal with whether there was a reasonable period uh, within which the landlord moved in. We had to deal with issues about actual occupancy. Did the landlord actually occupy the unit? Now, it is important to note that occupancy does not mean primary residence necessarily. You don't have to make it your primary residence, but you do have to occupy the unit. And then of course, there was the extenuating circumstances debate, which is to say that in some situations, the it was impossible after having issued the notice, it was impossible uh, for the landlord to fulfill uh, the, you know, the, the, the stated intention of the notice. For example, we had a one client at least where um, the mother was supposed to move in, she was elderly, she passed away before she could move in. So, you know, that, that would constitute an extenuating circumstance. And we then sought uh, the permission of the RTB to excuse our client uh, from that, you know, 12 month penalty. So what has changed now? Now we're on to the new requirements for landlords use and occupancy notices. First big change, the two month notice has now become a four month notice. And the period within which to challenge that notice has increased from 15 days to 30 days. Um, again, realtors are probably already looking at this and scratching their head thinking, oh man, this is gonna cause a lot of problems for our sales. And we'll get to that in a second. Uh, one month's rent compensation has remained unchanged. Good faith on the part of the landlord has remained unchanged, so it's still a requirement. Occupancy by the landlord or close family member, again, unchanged. However, here's another change. If you own a rental building, which has five or more rental units, you cannot issue a new four month notice. So it's just not possible anymore for, for larger rental buildings you, that you can take back possession of, of, the, of one of the units for personal use there, right? Not possible. And the other big change is that the four month notice form 
uh, PDF needs to be generated now through a web application on the RTB's website. So Shireen, you can fast forward to the next slide here and you'll see exactly what that web application looks like. So again, it's not sufficient. You can't just go to the RTB's website and download a copy of the PDF form. Now you have to have what's called a BCEID, which if ever you've applied to the RTB for a dispute resolution applica application, you probably already have such login. But if you don't, then you need to create one of these. And then you go through the, you know, I would say fairly uh, detailed uh, questions that you need to answer there, um, including providing the landlord's uh, uh, birth date. Um, if it's the purchaser, it's actually requiring that even the, the purchaser's birth date be, uh, be added there. Uh, obviously, information about the rental unit. Um, you know, th there's a, a whole ton of questions, basically, that you need to fill out. And effectively, then after you pay a fee, you generate the notice, and then you have to sign and deliver that notice to the tenant or in the context of purchase sales that the landlord would have to, to deliver that. So he, that's basically what we're talking about. Now, you may ask me, you know, from a policy standpoint, well, Oscar, wh why, did he, why did the government even bother to make this change? Well, you know, my answer is that the government was very concerned about uh, landlords issuing these type of notices on a frivolous basis or for frivolous reasons. And so they wanted to have essentially a directory, a registry of every landlord in BC that issued some type of notice like this. And that's how they basically created this. So here's the system we have right now. Uh, Shireen, you can go on to the next slide. Um, in terms of uh, four month notices in the context of sales, the three requirements that I mentioned before still apply. So not, nothing of, of the three requirements that I mentioned has changed there. Uh, there is a new requirement once the tenant has vacated now, and this is effective as of April 2nd, 2024, uh, there is a 12 month period within which you have to occupy the, uh, the rental unit. So it's no longer six months, it's a full year. Uh, the penalty for non-compliance is still 12 month penalty, 12 month rent, should I say. And there are new fines that have been permitted to be levied by the R RTB employees, um, compliance and enforcement unit there. So, you know, in a worst case scenario, if, you're, if your landlord is issuing a, a notice there, doesn't, you know, comply with it or doesn't uh, follow through the state intention, not only could they face a 12 month penalty claim by the tenant, but they could also potentially be fined in addition to that by the RTB. And now in terms of you know, what we expect to be some of the, the new issues here, well, <laughs> you know, good news for, for RTB lawyers like myself, all of the previous issues remain the same. I mean, I'm kind of joking about this because obviously as a landlord, I would like to have less issues, not more. But, you know, um, unfortunately, it seems like all of the issues that we were dealing with, all the debates that we had before are still going to be the same. But there's on top of that, there's going to be some new headaches to deal with. And what are some of these headaches? Well, first of all, um, again, the context of, of uh, sales here, um, the new web application as it currently stands to date. July 26th of 2024, uh, requires the disclosure of the contract of purchase sale. Uh, this is something that um, may put you as, as real estate professionals in breach of your professional obligations there. Um, and so this is something that I, and along with many others in the industry, have already brought forward to the RTB. Uh, the previous two-month notice was actually gave you an option to either disclose the contract purchase sale or the letter from the purchaser requesting that the notice be issued. And, you know, obviously it was mu much less problematic to disclose the letter than it would be to disclose a contract purchase sale, which should be kept confidential. Uh, but for some reason, the, the way the RTB designed this new portal um, it's now a situation where the contract to purchase sale has to be disclosed or is asked to be disclosed. 
Um, this is something that we're addressing. Um, I'm, I'm actually waiting to hear back from a, a senior policy advisor at the RTB about this. Hopefully I hear back from them next week there. Um, and uh, the other issue is the four month notice period um, I can well picture is going to put at least some deals in, in a much bigger risk of, of falling through because as, as you probably well know, most lenders will issue you about 120 day hold basically for your mortgage rate. Now, again, you know, you would need to remove your subject to financing offer or, 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 or your subject to financing clause uh, before you issue the notice to the tenant but it's a four month notice. Therefore, um, you're gonna need to have the completion date after that date, after the tenant moves out, but your 120 day mortgage hold would already expired by the completion date. So, you know, th th this is something that I, unfortunately, I think the policy makers, uh, you know, that, that we're looking into this, didn't really carefully consider. Uh, it seems to me like maybe they didn't, you know, really talk to many people in the industry to see what the ramifications would be. But here we are, we now have to deal with them because these are the new rules. Uh, Shereen, you want to put up the next slide here? Um, now I will mention extra occupancy charges very quickly. Uh, this is a simple one. Uh, if your tenants, sorry, if your clients, if your landlord clients are using the standard form RTV agreement, which is available on the RTV's website, that agreement is silent on the issue of extra occupants. However, the act, the RTA, the Residential Tenancy Act, does allow you to vary rent based on the number of occupants if there is a term in the tenancy agreement that allows you to do that. So for example, if you, know, you, you can say in your tenancy agreement that X and Y are the permitted occupants, and if there are any further occupants that need to be added or, or that the tenants want to add onto the, the agreement or in the rental unit, then they have to pay an extra, let's say $100 a month more in rent. That's allowable, except that now the government has changed that so that if that person who is being added is a minor or was a minor at the time that the tenancy agreement got signed, then you cannot charge extra rent for them. Uh, that makes sense in my mind. Um, you know, right now, uh, my wife and I were, were, were expecting our, our second child there. If we were renting a property and, you know, if we had an extra occupancy clause, you know, as soon as our child would be born, the landlord could turn around us and say, hey, extra hundred bucks a month or extra 200 bucks a month, whatever the, the tenancy agreement said there, right? And we would say, oh, well, that, you know, that's a nice welcome to the world for our baby and for us, right? So at the end of the day, you know, from a public policy standpoint, this one probably, you know, I can see makes a lot of sense there. But in any event, that, that's the change for extra occupancy clauses. Um, we can go on to the next slide, Shereen. And now I will get to what I mentioned was the coping strategies for landlords. So. Uh, first and foremost, and this is something that I, I, I tell uh, all of, you know, pretty well every landlord that I ever speak with in, in terms of practical advice, managing a tenant's expectations throughout the tenancy. So uh, the, the important thing that you need to keep in mind is that if you know, for example, that you're going to be taking back possession of the property in a year's time, let's say, right? You don't have to wait until the notice period to tell the tenant or to advise them of this upcoming change. You know, you can just have an informal conversation with the tenant and say, hey, tenant, look, you know, in, in the coming year, I'm gonna be looking to take back possession or I'm gonna be looking to sell the unit or whatever it is, right? And if you give them enough heads up, then, maybe they're going to be a little bit easier to accept that change uh, when the change, when the time comes for the change, right? Um, same kind of idea, basically, when it comes to tenant buyouts, which, by the way, now that the rules for four-month notices are so complex, I think more and more you're going to see people who are going to be relying on tenant buyouts, on mutual agreements to end tenancy, to end the tenancy, rather than these notices, right? And so again, if, if you are having a 
cooperative relationship with your tenant, a friendly relationship, then it's going to make it easier to negotiate such buyouts. Uh, we already talked about the 120-day uh, mortgage rate hold period. So that's something that, again, you're going to have to talk to your realtor about. You're going to have to talk about with your, your bank there if you're a landlord, right? Um, trying to figure out what you can do to get around that or, or what type of risk that you're willing to take, basically. Um, obviously, prior to issuing uh, any such notice, you should be fully aware of the recent requirements and the changes. Um, you should also keep in mind the service requirements of the app, right? So if you send something by registered mail to a tenant, that doesn't mean that it's deemed served the same day you sent it. In fact, the act says that a document sent by registered mail is deemed served the fifth day after it was sent, right? If you post something on the door to a, uh, to, of a rental unit, it's deemed served the third day after it was posted, right? So you have to keep those in mind. And then finally, or a couple more things, if a notice is challenged or if a tenant is seeking monetary compensation, uh, for example, the 12 month penalty, uh, best to seek legal advice, right? Um, it, it's often the situation that these type of matters, if you try to do them on your own and you fail, then the cost of remedying that are astronomically larger than if you would get a lawyer to start on the issue from the beginning of the problem, right? So don't wait too long to address this and don't wait too long to get legal advice. And finally, if, you, if your tenancy agreement doesn't have an extra occupancy clause, well, you should add one, but if it does, then uh, you make sure, you wanna make sure that that uh, clause complies with the new restrictions there. So those are the coping strategies. Um, I, I thank everyone for attending. Uh, Shireen, I assume that a lot of people are going to have some questions there and, and maybe I have answers and maybe not. Maybe I have more questions than answers. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Oscar. You definitely answered uh, a few of the questions, but then <clears throat> a few of the other questions that I have right in front of me are the type of clarifying um, the terms, terminology, like what is meant by a landlord? Let's start with this one. What is meant by a landlord? And what if the landlord is a corporation? Uh, could you please um, clarify that? Yeah. Well, so, uh, I mean, the, the act does define landlord. The Residential Tenancy Act does define landlord. And, um, you know, it includes uh, uh, any sort of agent of the landlord as well. Um, but uh, in terms of the, you know, these notices, uh, Section 49 of the Act there does actually talk about that provides a further definition of what a landlord is for the purpose of issuing uh, what is now a four month notice. And it does include or can include uh, corporately held properties, basically, but effectively that the interest in, in, in those properties, the, the person who's issuing the notice has to hold at least a one half interest uh, in, in uh, you know, by way of the shares uh, in the company that owns the property there. So uh, none of the, just to be clear, none of the changes that were recently in place prevented a landlord from taking back possession where, uh, you know, they would have been be able to, would be able to do so through a company, basically through, through a corporate holding. Uh, those rules have not changed. But obviously, you know, the, the stuff that we discussed, uh, you know, in terms of the length of the notice has there and, uh, and pretty well everything else in terms of the changes that we just did. So, yeah, but, but, but definition of landlord has not changed. Okay. And in, in your ability to do this when it's a corporately held property also has not changed. Thank you. Oscar, there are two um, dates. One of them is when the, the new changes were introduced, April 3rd, 2024. And the second one was uh, a usage of the web portal, uh, July 18. Now, if um, somebody has uh, already submitted, served a notice to vacate before July 18th, but after April 3rd, uh, would there be the six months occupancy obligation of the landlord? Um, which one would, which date would be, uh, would require the landlord to stay at the premises for six, minimum six months or 12 months? Okay, so so you're, you're talking essentially about the 
uh, the the uh, requirement that changed uh, to occupy for 12 months versus six months. Right. That was that 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 change has actually been in effect since I believe it was April second of twenty twenty four. So if okay. you would have issued a notice on April second, twenty twenty four, that notice would still have been a two month notice. So mm -hmm. not what we're talking about right now. It would have still been a two month notice. However, by that time, the occupancy requirement would have been twelve months. Moments. Right. So, so, so that's so, so, so it's important to understand that you, you may have had some notices that are still two months, but are subject to the 12 month occupancy clause as opposed to the six month one. Right. And obviously, you know, um, now if, if you would have issued a notice on July 18th, right, then you would have had to go through the portal. Um, th there, there was an interesting uh, question that somebody asked me earlier this week about uh, uh, more recently about notices. So they said, well, you know, we issued a two month notice on July 16th. Uh, you know, what does that count? Is that uh, does that is that notice valid still? And the RTV basically on its in its guidelines says that it's not the date that you sent the notice that count, it's the date that it was deemed received. So likely if the notice was sent by registered mail on July 16th, it wouldn't be deemed served until July 21st, basically, in which case you would have already been subject to the four month notice and going through the portal. So even the notices that you think would have been sent before the July 18th date, but if they weren't received by the tenant or weren't deemed received by the tenant by that date or before that date, they need to be reset. They're not going to be effective. Thank you. Thank you. That was actually one of my questions um, because we had Drag a similar mind. case. <laughs> we had, and then we rushed in to, to serve the notice before July 18th, but then we were not really mindful of the, the, the time in between that uh, a notice is considered um, or deemed received. Now, a question now is uh, once we apply through the web portal, when is the notice considered or deemed as received? Well, so, so generating the notice um, is just one step of the process, but you know, and, and, and to be clear, this is still very new there. So I, I actually, when I was playing around with the portal myself, I, I went as far as I could without pressing submit, basically, right? So I don't actually, I'm kind of guessing what is actually going to happen if you press submit. But what I assume would happen is that the portal or the web application is going to generate a PDF document that you then have to print and sign and then serve. And the, the service is still, however, whichever method you use to serve. So again, if it's registered mail, then it's deemed served the fifth day after it was sent. Um, you know, as, as a matter of uh, practice, um, our lawyers all will send documents by registered mail because you have the tracking information, but we also encourage you to uh, send a courtesy copy by email to the tenants that may or may not count as service depending on the wording of your tenancy agreement. But um, you know, the reality is people check their emails faster than they will their mail. So you know, generally I recommend using at least two different methods of service there. But the service methods have not changed to answer your question. It's just a matter of going through the process, generating the notice, and then you rely on the same service methods as before. Thank you. Um, there is a question on chat box, one of our agents. Uh, first of all, he, she's thanking you for the brilliant uh, uh, presentation. Thank you, very informative. Her question is, she owns a condo and then she talked to me last night about this uh, situation as well. And then she's planning to sell it by uh, by next spring, by January, February. She wants uh, February, she wants to sell it. Now in between, she wants to have her a tenant and place a tenant there. Can she have a month to month and then after uh, on a month to month basis tenancy agreement and then then she has to provide four months notice again? What is the situation? Then? Well, so the problem is that if, if the idea is just to get vacant possession 
uh, prior to the sale. I guess it really depends on how she wants to sell it, right? If she's okay selling it as a tenanted property or no. potentially as, well, okay. So, so if that's not the case, if the idea is to get vacant possession prior to the sale, um, sure, you can put it on a one month to month notice there or a month to month tenancy, but you're, you're pretty much your only option to end that tenancy at that point will be by way of a mutual agreement there. Um, you know, there, there's not really any, you know, if you think back to December 2017, that's when the BC government, that's when they started some of these changes, basically. And the first of the changes that they did there, the first of the notable changes to the act is that they got rid of the uh, fixed term with a mandatory vacate. So it used to be that you would, you know, prior to December uh, of 2017, you used to be able to enter into a tenancy agreement that would say, well, you know, it's for a fixed term from April 1st of 2020 to, you know, I don't know, July of 2020, let's say. And after that fixed term, the tenant must move out. No reason provided, right? Um, that is no longer the case. Now, even if you have a fixed term like that, it reverts by operation of law into a month to month tenancy, unless, unless you've provided a valid reason uh, to uh, obtain vacant possession. And the only valid reason that you can provide right now as permitted by the regulation is that you actually intend on moving back into the property after the fixed term. So, you know, to answer the question, basically, unless your, your uh, client or, or, or the person in question, the landlord, is actually wanting to occupy the property, and now, again, it's subject to a 12-month uh, occupancy period, um, unless they want to occupy the property for 12 months after the tenant leaves, really the only way right now to end this tenancy is by way of a mutual agreement. And I would even go so far as to say, and to caution, that because some landlords, I mean, it was only going to be a matter of time before they were going to do this there, but some landlords, you know, what they used to do is they said, okay, we'll sign a tenancy agreement. And then on the same day, we will sign a mutual agreement and tenancy that is future dated basically, right? Uh, wrong. The, the RTB has also uh, taken the position that that was just an attempt to contract out of the act there. So it's really a situation where you have to enter into the tenancy agreement and if you're nearing the you know, date that you want to take back possession, you're going to have to talk to your tenant about it. And you're going to have to come up with some sort of offer to incentivize them to sign a mutual agreement and tenancy at that time. That's really the only way to go about it, unfortunately. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I see we have uh, two of our licensed property managers. Oscar is, is raised to his hand. Oscar, please. And then Fruzan. After Oscar, Fruzan will ask her question. Hey, Oscar. Hi, Sharon. Thanks for uh, the great presentation. Oscar, congrats on baby number two there. Great Thank stuff. Uh, I have three questions. Um, the first question is in regards to serving notice. If we serve notice in person, it's still considered being served right then and there, right? Correct. Okay, excellent. I had a similar situation to Shirin's where we had to serve notice before the 18th and I met the person, my tenant in person and took photos and everything just to be sure. So that's good. Uh, the other question that I have for you is in regards to the structure of the tenancy and all of these new rules, which are absolutely ridiculous. Um, are they all in effect in regards to a sublease? Yeah, so 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 effectively, if you're, you know, I, I mean, put it this way, in, in the, the sublease is is one of the rare situations again where you can have a fixed term with a mandatory vacate. So in a sublease, you can have a situation where you may not want to rely on a four month notice. You may actually want to create a fixed term with a mandatory vacate and specify that it is a sublease. Right, but there is also the you know the possibility that in a sublease that you you know you you issue a four month notice there, and then effectively the principal tenant will be the subtenant's landlord if that makes sense. So in a sublease, I still have to provide four month notice. I still have to use the portal, but I guess at that point my question is: Are we able to say that a tenancy is? You know, not, nowadays, 90 days is a minimum. So could I 
through a sublease. So somebody, a client rents the property to their sister. The sister hires us to rent the property on her behalf as a sublease. And we get a tenant for 90 days. Are, do we, are we able to say in that tenancy agreement that it is a fixed term tenancy because it's a sublease and therefore we don't need to provide uh, the form of notice? So, so by letter of the law, what your the, the the arrangement that you're proposing would seem to work. The problem, and it goes back to the the similar the 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 section of the act that I talked about about um, that, that there is a section of the act that says any attempt to contract out of this act is null and void. And so, if if the RTB basically looks at this arrangement and says, you know what, you weren't actually, you know truly wanting to, uh, you know, to have your sister or brother be the tenant, but that really this was just concocted to try to, you know, get around the rules of the act. If, if the RTB got the full picture of that, they may rule against you on the basis that it was an attempt <clears throat> to contract out of the act. So essentially this, you know, this is a situation where I would say it's really dependent on your risk tolerance or your client's risk tolerance. If, if, if you put that into effect there, their proposed arrangement there, um, it could potentially work, right? As long as you know that the tenant, uh, the subtenant knows that it's actually subtenancy and that that is why you're ending the tenancy early, then, you know, you could possibly get away with it. But if, if they dig deeper, basically, and, and you know, the, the, there's a compelling argument to make, I think, uh, then potentially the RTB could rule against you and say the whole arrangement was just a sham. All right. And. Um, hmm, OK. What about. Uh, yeah, no, I don't have another scenario. I see what you're saying. That's tough. That's tough. This Look, are, these are very, I'll, very I'll stupid rules. I'll be rules. perfectly honest with you. You know, the, the, the government has really, really made it difficult for landlords to have any sort of flexibility anymore. Um, Why would anybody you know, want to be a landlord? Well, you know... That's I, the I, problem. I, you know, That's I, the biggest I problem. I, I wouldn't get too much into politics there. Um, <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm going to kind of hold myself <laughs> back from, you know, any sort of political commentary. Smart, smart. But, but, but the fact of the matter is that you're right. Um, you know, that the further you push the needle or the, you, you know, tilt the table in the tenant's favor, you know, at some point in time, landlords are going to say, you know what, this is not worth my time anymore. Um, I'm going to get out of landlording. So, yeah. I um I think I forgot my third question out of frustration. Thank you, Oscar. <laughs> now it's Thank back you. to Fruzan. Fruzan. Hi, Oscar. Um, Hi there. I have a question. Um, is it valid to have a mutual agreement to end the tenancy at the beginning of the tenancy while you're uh, signing the lease agreement? Is it is it going to be valid if you at the no. same time? you uh, sign a, a mutual agreement to end the tenancy at a certain time. Yeah, um, that's been tested. And, you know, I can unequivocally say that the RTB has, you know, cracked down on those type of arrangements and, and said that this is an attempt to contract out of the act. So unfortunately, you know, again, you know, somebody creates the rules, somebody else comes up with a creative solution to get out of those rules. And then the RTB rules against those people. So, you know, th th that's how it usually works there. Um, you know, the, the, the creative workarounds are only good until the RTB says they're no longer good. <laughs> okay, thank you. thank you. Yeah. So next, next question I have in chat box. So, and I'm gonna reframe it, incorporate my own question as well. So um, once, obviously we can have a fixed term contract or tenancy agreement. And then the, the reason is there should be uh, pointed out what the reason is that the owner wants to move back into the rental property now, and which is possible. Am I correct? Yes, it is possible. Yes, you can, you can have a fixed term with a mandatory vacate where the reason yes. to vacate is because the owner wants to move back and take possession. Correct. Now, my question is, should the landlord again provide a four month four months notice plus uh, compensation, one month rent-free compensation to the tenant? No, 
So, so, so that's the rare situation where if you're signing the tenancy agreement, you know, at the time and you're stating to the tenant within the tenancy agreement that you're going to be taking back possession, then there's no four month notice to be given. And as a consequence, there's no one month rent compensation either. But that, that's the narrow situation where you can, like I said, where, where you can have a fixed term, take back possession at the end of the fixed term, and there's no compensation due and there's no notice to be given to the tenant because they would have already received the notice within the tenancy agreement itself. Beautiful. Now, another question is, um, is it legal to pay rent uh, to the landlord in cash? Um, and then without mentioning in the contract um, a tenancy agreement, and then it's just a verbal agreement. So they just want to make sure that the tenant is paying, landlord is requiring the tenant to pay rent in cash. Would it be okay? So that sounds like a very shady uh, agreement there. Um, <laughs> one that uh, potentially the CRA may have objection to. Um, but uh, no, look, uh, you know, the so, so it is possible or legal to pay your rent in cash where uh, your, the, the rent is paid in cash, uh, the act requires the landlord to give a receipt. And you know, that, that may actually defeat the purpose of paying in cash, right? Because if you know, presumably the landlord is trying to uh, get around some sort of income tax issue there, uh, then you know, they wouldn't want to issue a receipt of any kind there. But the act actually does require you to issue a receipt there as a landlord. Um, and, uh, uh, I mean, you know, it is a, is a verbal tenancy agreement, uh, still a tenancy agreement? Well, yes, it can be. The act does require the landlords to put the tenancy agreement in writing, but, you know, it, legally speaking, if you don't have a written tenancy agreement, you still may have a tenancy. Uh, it'll depend a lot on the facts, right? But, you know, if, if there's rent that's being paid in exchange for use of a rental property, then, you know, you're, it's likely that there will still be a tenancy agreement in place, even if it's not in writing. Oh, Shireen, I Oops, think you're on Sorry, Shana, is, um, Shana wants to ask her question. Shana, please go ahead. Hi, Oscar. Thank you so much for your time and your valuable advice. Um, what would happen if the landlord um, has a trouble paying for the mortgage and has to sell? What would, like, then can they just e give them a notice for months and say, hey, we, like, for instance, like, we cannot pay the mortgage, we have to sell it. Then what would no. happen? No. So, so there, there's, there's no notice to end a tenancy based on the landlord's inability to pay their mortgage. Um, you know, the, uh, you know, I've had situations before, I've seen situations before where uh, the, you know, where, where a landlord has decided to effectively um, consolidate their debts or, or kind of reduce their liabilities, if you will, they would sell the property that they're currently in and want to move into their rental property because they can't afford paying two mortgages, let's say, right? And in those situations, you know, the, the, at least in one such situation, I've, I've seen where the RTB has upheld the, again, previously two month notice, now would be four month notice. So, um, you know, it can be a valid grounds to say, look, you know, we, we need to move back into the property because we needed to liquidate our, our current property and we have this other property that we own that is tenanted right now but you know we need to we need to occupy that property because our, our other property is in the process of being sold or already sold there and that you know we can only afford one mortgage right so so that is an option there yeah oh thank you i see oscar b is uh, raising his hand one more question, uh, then uh, we'll pass it on to Austin. I think you remembered his last question there. Uh, I did. I remember, my, I remember my last question. Okay, I, I you was go able ahead, to then. calm down. I was able Oscar, to calm down ahead. when he came back. <laughs> um, you mentioned, Oscar, about uh, signing the mutual agreement to end tenancy the same day that the RTA is signed, something that a lot of people have done and the board frowns upon. What would be a reasonable amount of time without having to wait until you actually need to serve it, right? Like I'm signing a contract with a client for say 10 months and 
in the conversation, the expectation is you have to move in 10 months for whatever reason. We're offering a 10-month tenancy uh, and we're looking for a tenant that wants to leave in 10 months and they're willing to sign this mutual agreement, which is our safety. When would it be a good time? Because I don't want to wait till the ninth month to give it to them and maybe they change their mind. So That's could I give it to them a week later? I mean, I think a week is still going to be pushing it there. Um, you know, in my mind, uh, sorry, I think there's some noise in the background there. Somebody's maybe has their or failed to put their mute on there. Um, in any event, uh, look, I think a week later is still going to be uh, deemed to be attempting to contract out of the act. Um, I don't really have a perfect answer for you because a lot of it is going to be very circumstantial, dependent on the facts of the specific case there. But, you know, the idea would be that the closer you can move it, like, you know, towards the end of the tenancy, the more likely it is that it's going to be upheld, um, you know, because it'll appear more as though the parties had now contemplated, uh, you know, the end of the tenancy, as opposed to trying to create a fixed term tenancy at the very beginning uh, with a mandatory vacate where there is none. So, you know, or not available. So, so like I said, you know, there's not really one specific right answer. Okay. I, I would just, again, I would talk to your client and I would say, what, what is your client's tolerance of risk there and see how far back they're willing to push it towards the end of the tenancy there. Yeah, I think that there's less risk signing the mutual agreement to begin with than to leaving it up to the tenant's good faith to decide to leave. Uh, but yeah, possibly, it depends possibly, on each client. But, but, but you do want to talk to your client about that because again, if yes. it does get challenged at the RTB, it almost certainly will get set aside there. So yeah. that's something to All keep right. in mind as well. Awesome. Um, Shereen, Thanks, Oscar. I, I would, oh, absolutely, Oscar. Um, I, I would I would uh, suggest that because um, I, I assume there might may be more questions and there may even be more questions after when when everybody has a chance to have lunch there and, and then they say, oh, well, I, I thought of this question. So um, what I may suggest, Shireen, is that for, for members of your team that have additional questions, maybe they send them to you and then you can send me an email with uh, whatever, you know, the balance of the questions are and then I can send a written response. Um, and that way everybody can, you know, have their lunch and, uh, you know, maybe for those of you that were watching the Olympic opening ceremonies, you can get back to that now. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. That, uh, thank you for being so considerate. Thank you. That, that's actually something that came to my mind, but I wanted, I didn't dare to ask you, would it be possible to send the questions to you? Uh, because, and I know who was asked the questions. I can, once I have the answers, I can just uh, send them back with the answers. But then there is one of our agents, um, if it is possible, though, maybe two more questions. One, sure. um, I'll let Farah ask her question. And then the last question, because I had about five different people asking me the same question, and it's very important. We are dealing with it on a daily basis. Then uh, we'll wrap up our session today. Brilliant so far. Thank you so much, Oscar. I'll pass it Absolutely. on to Farah. Go ahead, Farah. Thanks, Oscar. This is a separate what? Uh, from what we were talking about. It's about when we fill out the RTA, the residential tenancy agreement. <clears throat> there are two areas that uh, ask for email address for service. There's first one and then they're both optional. If I put two email address, if there is a service, does the email have to be sent to both or just the first one? Um, I mean, there's nothing in the act that says that it would have to be sent to both. So I think an email address, you know, uh, like, like one email would be sufficient there, in my view. Um, I, I, I don't see any requirement for both there. Now, if, if it's, you know, let, let's say if you're trying to serve both tenants and, you know, there's two tenants and, and you know, you, you want to serve them with, with both, you know, each a copy, then you know, maybe it might be better to, you know, include both emails. But what I'm trying to say is if, if, it, if it's just a matter of one tenant who has provided two separate emails, maybe a work email and a personal email, as long as they provided, as long as you sent them uh, the, the, the notice to one of those emails, then that should be effective service. It's usually in joint tenancy. So there are two tenants on the agreement. Yeah, if, if it's two and tenants, then the I would send them to, to both of the emails there. Because you want to make sure that both are served there. Because there's another form called Address for Service. Um, RTB, I think, number 50 or 51, something like that. There is a new form that came out since yes. COVID. 
And in yeah. that, again, um, one email address or both, because the one is obviously much easier to trace and versus if it's two one says I didn't receive it. I'm, I'm not sure what the best option is. Like I said, if, if it's if it's two tenants and mm -hmm. each provides an email address, I would send it to both. If it's oh. one, basically, if it's if it's one tenant who provided two separate email addresses, then yeah. either or. I mean, I, I mean, it doesn't cost you anything. You still send it to both there. But what I'm trying to say is, if you end up if you're looking back at your records and you're saying, "Oh crap, I only sent it to one of their emails," that's fine. That's not an issue. Okay, thank you. Now the last question, Oscar, is uh, in North Shore we do have a lot of families, property owners who rent out their basement suite. Now they want to serve the, uh, these landlords want to serve uh, the tenant who is resigning the basement suite to move out four months notice fine, but then they want to carve out a portion of the basement suite and then use it for Airbnb because Airbnb now these days is uh, at least for single families is allowed to some extent. Um, would it be possible to do that? So if it is a two bedroom basement suite, three bedroom, uh, the tenant vacates. They do not fully occupy the basement suite, carve out one bedroom, use it as Airbnb, or rent it out to a student. Would it be possible? Um, I, I would, I'd have to double check the guidelines there because um, the, the RTB guide, the RTB issues these guidelines that are updated on a regular basis. Um, I, off the top of my head, I don't know if it says anything specifically about Airbnb, but, um, you know, I, I would suggest that the RTB will probably look at this type of scenario um, with Airbnb and short-term rentals as same as if you would have just carved out a portion of the suite and re-rented, let's say, a smaller suite there, regardless of whether it was short-term or not. Um, I think the RTB would still find a reason to impose the 12-month penalty because the idea is that, you know, you're you have the basement suite, you're saying that, you know, you in your notice, you're saying that you need the full, you're going to occupy the full basement suite for whatever purpose. And then if you do anything less than that, then I, I think the RTB will find a reason to issue the 12 month notice or sorry, the 12 month penalty there. Um, that again, subject to a review of the RTB guidelines there, it, it may be a possibility that they said something specifically in the guidelines that um, would allow such an activity, but I would be surprised if that was the case. Um, I, I think it's more likely that, you know, now it's different though, it's different if you, um, let's say you're uh, op occupying the whole property, and then let's say you leave to Europe for like a couple of weeks, and during that time you rent out your entire property on Airbnb, you know, for, for for just for those two weeks there, and then you're back occupying the property. That's different because you know that th that type of short-term accommodation basically is just incidental to your occupancy. But the the problem is that if you've carved out a specific portion of that suite there of, of the basement suite and use it continuously for Airbnb, then that means you're not actually occupying the unit for yourself. Then you're just running a business out of it essentially. And in my mind, I, I think that could la land you in hot water with the RTB. So um, I, I would, you know, if somebody's very serious about that. You know, I would say, you know, we, we can certainly, they can contact us. We can double check the guidelines there, the RTV's guidelines. There may be some sort of niche carve out of this, but, you know, as, as a rule of thumb or as, as kind of, a, you know, what, what I suspect the RTV is going to say is that they're going to say that that's offside the act there. Yeah. Thanks again. Your answer leads to another question, but I'm not going to answer. I'm not going to ask. Send it. To, I'll, I'll ask it via email. Thanks to I, I told you that my, my, my presentation was to, you know, create more questions and answers, but hopefully at least, you know, at least some of you can sleep a little better at night there after this. Yeah. Very useful, for sure. Um, so once again, thanks to everyone who attended. Thanks uh, a million to Oscar. It's a really, it was really helpful, informative. Everybody is, uh, yeah, sending me thank, uh, thank you notes and messages. Uh, looking forward to having more sessions with Oscar, and then hopefully if we can do it regularly, we appreciate it. Uh, ben, thanks again. Thank you very much, Shereen. See you we, next we, time. Thank you very much for the support. We will and, post uh, this on you know, YouTube. Yeah.
uh, oh well you know what that's fine there i i it's funny there because uh you know i used to back in the days this is just a total side note here but uh when i was in university and in law school i taught salsa courses beginner salsa courses uh kind of to, for beer money uh and and i would at the end of the class i would tell the class look if you want to you know kind of record the moves that i just taught you you can take out your phone and and record them uh, but I said, don't put any of the recordings on YouTube because I'm not looking to become a salsa celebrity there. Uh, anyways, I'm sure if you look hard enough, you might still find salsa uh, videos of me there and very embarrassing ones, um, all of which my wife uncovered already. Uh, but, uh, you know, but, but the point is that you can, you're welcome to put this on YouTube is what I'm trying to say. Maybe it'll, uh, you know, change up the algorithm so you see more of Oscar the lawyer, not Oscar the salsa dancer. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, well, but before before submitting to before posting on YouTube, I'll make sure that we'll pass it on to you. Get your final approval. Sure. Absolutely. Thank you, Shereen. Everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.